All right. Hello again. I'm saying again because we've been here before, not here here, but at Academy. The first time being in 2021, where I talked about what's cooking for KDE Framework 6, where I sort of uh, elaborated and presented on various ideas and goals we had in mind for Framework 6. At the same academy, Kevin Ottens was presenting KF6, the architecture overview, where he had a sort of more architectural approach uh, and description in mind. And then in the next year, uh, I was at Qt DevCon, which is a developer conference more focused on Qt, where I also talked about our way to Qt 6 and a bit about KF6. And then, of course, there was academy again. So first of all, last year, Volker talked about the plans and progress in a, in a short talk about where we were back then. And then Alex and I had a, a longer talk about some uh, more in-depth topics and how to port your apps to make use of KF6. And then later that year, I gave a keynote at KubeCon Brazil in and where I also talked about our journey to Qt6 and beyond. So you're starting to see a pattern. Every year at Academy, there's one more person on stage. But you can be assured next year there won't be four people on stage because this is going to be the last Academy we're going to talk about KF6, hopefully. So how did it all start? The first time we started talking about KF6 was also at Academy four years ago, which is a long time by now. Um, in Milan, Qt6 wasn't out back then, but it was on the horizon, so it was ample time to start thinking about that. And that's what we did in a BOF session. And a couple of weeks later, some of us met in Berlin for an in-person sprint, back then when people still that did in-person sprint, and talked about it. And we discussed ideas, we set out design goals, we came up with a huge workboard on Fabricator that at some point had close to 500 tasks on it. And we, of course, started working towards that. And then two years later, in 2021, we did another sprint, this time online for reasons, which was used to sort of refine the workboard, discuss some of the items that need discussion, and just generally make progress. And at some point, we also started having regular online meetings where we once a week or once every two weeks got together for an hour and discussed various topics that came up during the week, which proved very helpful sometimes. So what were the goals that we had in mind for KF6? The obvious one is we want to use Qt6. That's sort of the baseline requirement we're talking here. But we wanted to do more. The perhaps most important goal we had in mind was porting should be as easy as possible. That was a goal for Qt in the Qt6 transition and we wanted to have the same. So no complicated needless breakage. Breakage should be as obvious as possible and as obvious to fix as possible. Then of course we want to have better APIs, APIs that are easier to misuse, are clearer, have a clear purpose, are not duplicated, are not better served with Qt or the C++ standard library, for example. Then a lot of our code is based on Qt widgets, but we're getting increasingly more Qt Quick and QML code, but some of the frameworks things we have are still quite a bit entangled with Qt widgets, sometimes in trivial, sometimes in not trivial ways. And we want to have a better separation between the UI agnostic part and the actual UI part so that it's easier to use all of the frameworks things from, for example, QML. Then another goal we had in mind was reducing the dependencies some of our frameworks have because dependencies are not nice and dragging things along that you don't need is not nice and especially for some things like Kio, this really was an a hindrance to, for third-party developers to actually make use of our nice libraries. And we also wanted to have a better separation between an interface to something and its implementation. 
For example, for K Wallet, we have an API that the library uses to talk to the passport system. Then we have the implementation of the actual passport system. And we wanted to have those a bit separated so that it's easier to, for example, plug into an operating system's native passport storage system like we have on Windows, for example. And that ties into the, the next goal, which is better cross-platform support for platforms like Windows, Android, Mac OS, or just non-Plasma Linux systems. So I've mentioned that I gave a, a talk at QCon Brazil last year, and they give, gave me a, a nice slide template, and it had this slide that says, as a placeholder, this is a quote, words full of wisdom that someone important said and can make the reader get inspired. And I thought it was a nice idea, and I really wanted to have a nice quote for it, but all I could think about was something we kept saying at the last Plasma Sprint in Valencia, which is, are we there yet? <laughs> so, are we there yet for Framework 6? The answer is, sort of. When I was preparing my talk at QDEFCON, I came up with a handy website that automatically tracks how many of our projects are ported to Qt6 by looking at the CI configuration. And I called it iskde using Qt6.org. So if you open that right now, it will tell you that 380 out of 528 projects built against Qt6 right now, which is most of them for some definition of most, but don't read this as a progress indicator. We're probably not gonna ever get to 100% there, and that's fine. And it's most importantly not a blocker for an actual KF6 release. Then earlier this year, Plasma and Frameworks started relying exclusively on KF6 and Qt6. Previously, development has been going on in a way where we build against both at the same time, but at some point we said, okay, we're going all in on six now, five maintenance continues in a separate branch, and that's the situation where we are with Frameworks and Plasma right now. And it's working out quite well. The, the Plasma 6 session, is already quite usable. I'm using it right now on this laptop to give you this presentation. I would show you, but it just looks like Plasma, so not much to see there. We still have a few items on the workboard left. The, the done column has about 260 tasks out of 400 something, but again, don't read this as a sort of progress indicator because some of them are more organizational than actionable, and some of them are more optional or wish list. But there are still a few challenges for us ahead before we can think about releasing A6.0, and Volker's gonna tell you all about them. Um, right, so in terms of things that definitely have to happen before the release, I think we have um, one major thing to sort out. Um, and that is the whole coexistence um, story, right? So we don't only have the, the luxury situation of Qt6 apps in a Plasma 6 session, we also have Qt5 apps in a Plasma 6 session, Qt6 apps in a Plasma 5 session, um, we have KF6 apps in non-Plasma sessions, right, in all possible combinations there. Um, and there is um, various things that could interfere with that working nicely. Um, the probably most common one um, is uh, file system collisions, so just things installing in the same location, right, and that doesn't work. Um, that's usually what is uh, referred to as co-installability, um, but that's, this is only part of the, the bigger coexistence uh, story. Right? It's, it's the one we run into during, during build time, which makes this easy to deal with. Um, the other ones tend to be a bit more, uh, more nasty. Um, example of this is, uh, for example, debug service names, right? They, they have to be unique, so we can't have two processes claiming the same, the same name. Um, at the same time, we have services that, that can't just arbitrarily coexist, right? So something like the, the wallet system. Um, 
whether an application can restore its credentials shouldn't depend on whether it's using Qt5 or Qt6 or running in a matching session, right? That should just work. Um, so there's things that, that we can't just have in, in parallel. Um, another problem area is the whole plugin-based platform integration. So the, the most visible part of this is, um, uh, is typically the style. Um, and right now, this problem doesn't even seem that big because um, the Plasma 5 pre-style and the Plasma 6 pre-style are pretty much identical from a visual point of view. But as, uh, like, over time, we expect the Plasma 6 style to somewhat evolve and change, right? And a Qt5 app running in a Plasma 6 session should still use the new style, right? So we need that also in a compatible way for, for Qt5. Um, same thing with the, like the, the file system, uh, the file dialog integration. Um, you want to use the, the proper platform file dialog and not some, some fallback uh, and all the stuff that pulls in. Um, similar problem with the like, generic application plugins. Um, things like the uh, console part or the, the ocular part, right? So if you have a Qt5 based Dolphin and a Qt6 based Kate, both of them should still have their embedded console terminal. Um, it shouldn't depend on in which session you're running, which of those will get the, the terminal. Right? Um, and then there's some, some really dark corners when we get to environment variables set by the, the session and so on. Um, none of those are usually hard to solve. It's just many of them, and we need to go through all of them and look case by case on how to, to address them. Um, Typically, we have like three different standard approaches uh, that we can apply, um, and in some rare scenarios, we might need some special solutions. Um, the probably most common solution is, um, or approach we, we take is versioning, right? So this is basically what applies to all the libraries. Um, you just increment the version number, and then things can happily live uh, side by side. Um, that's easy on the, on the library side. It requires adjustments to, to all consumers, basically. Um, for libraries, right, CMAC checks that for us at one time. This is a bit uh, more difficult to spot, you know, especially right now where there is still a lot of five infrastructure around. And if I'm still using the wrong DBus name, for, for example, right, I might not notice. Uh, so some of this only shows up as, as we move to a pure six session. Um, another standard approach is exclusivity, uh, exclusivity, exclusivity, well, just having one of the things, right? <laughs> um, um, so like in the wallet scenario, right? Then um, in some cases, we, we need to retrofit build options there to disable stuff in five um, because we weren't prepared for this. Um, and we might need uh, adjustments in packaging, um, but it's generally completely transparent for um, for the consumer side. Um, however, that also kind of implies that we need to stay compatible across major version changes. Um, uh, a very uh, prominent example of that part is also the icon themes. Um, they are very big, right? So we don't want to duplicate them. Um, and there we have the XTG icon spec, which defines the compatibility anyway, right? So there is no risk that, that we but there we can't break the compatibility anyway, right? So that is an example for, for using this approach. Um, a much less commonly used approach is uh, multi-builds. So the, sing uh, the same code base with a single run of the build system produces libraries for both Qt versions. Um, this is something we haven't historically used in, in KDE. Um, a prominent example is, is Poplar, right? That produces Qt bindings for, for both versions. But this has recently been also proposed by, by David and Harald um, for, for example, for Phonon and uh, for things like the, the Breeze style, uh, that might also be uh, an interesting option. Um, it, however, requires that the 5 and 6 code base kind of stay aligned. Um, and it limits our ability to eventually retire the, the Qt5 support, right? If we do this too early, then we basically end up in the same problem again. We can't co-install this. Um, right, and then we get to the dark corners. Um, when we think about the API, um, then that is usually like C++, 
uh, QML and, and maybe CMake, right? Um, however, there is more that is de facto API, um, like the executables we install and their, their interface and their names, or the environment variables, or the, um, all the stuff we put in Dbus. And since we don't really think about this as API, um, but people use it as API, right? There, there is some ambiguity on what is guaranteed there, and then people get creative. Um, an interesting example we found there is how the KDE session uh, version variable is interpreted. Some users just concatenate that on DBus names or executable names, right? And then basically assume that the same thing will exist with the version six as well. Others just error out. Um, and I mean, this, this happens in like niche applications like Chromium or LibreOffice, um, or things like the XDG utils, which they do features like basically opening files and URLs on the entire Linux platform, right? So also kind of important, uh, or, or libraries we use like Qt Keychain. Um, so we need to identify all of those things also in the external consumers and then see if we can make the new API kind of match their expectation or if we need to fix stuff upstream there now so it's ready in time when we get to, to releasing KF6. Um, and yeah, so as I said, this is probably the, the only really hard blocker. There is, however, many more things that we still would like to see, or even things that are somewhat critical to get done, like ECM isn't able yet to build APKs, so that's a pretty hard problem on Android. Um, and there's things we would like to get done in, in Kio to be able to replace the, the aging HTTP implementation, for example, um, and a lot more. But Worst case, we'd survive with, with all of that done for the, the initial release. Um, if you're interested in, in discussing those details and working on those details, we have a buff on this um, Tuesday uh, at four o'clock. Um, we'll we also have another buff on Monday about uh, how you port your applications, and that is what Alex is going to talk to you about now. Yeah, thanks, Volker. And first of all, we're going to talk about the KDE source build setup for porting your apps. And like always, this utility is your friend and helper when it comes to building KDE software. And it takes care of a few things for the KF6 builds. For example, choosing the correct CMIG arguments, because in some projects you explicitly need to turn on the uh, KF6 or Q6 builds and sometimes you need to um, disable some deprecated APIs. And it also chooses the correct branches for you um, because projects, for example, Dolphin, have a separate KF6 branch, but we'll come to that uh, in a moment. It can also compile third-party packages, for example, dependencies that are needed to build um, other KDE framework other, or other KDE software in general. And the KF6 builds are configured by the uh, global branch group settings. So it's the global section of your KDE um, source build config file, and you just need to specify the branch group to the value kf 6 q 6 And then it automatically knows uh, what the correct CMIG arguments are and uh, what branch it should check out. Um, but it is recommended to have a separate um, prefix from your KF5 one because there are still some remaining constability issues and apps, for example, Dolphin, um, don't simply need to be fully co-installable. And that is configured using the KDE dir variable, which is like the install directory and also the source directory and build directory. You could maybe reuse the source directory, but uh, that would make the rebuilding process take a lot longer. And you can do this, of course, in your main config file, or you can have a separate or custom config file, and you can pass that in using the rc file um, argument to KDE source build. But since we are lazy and efficient, it is best to have a simple alias for it. Um, you have a snippet there that just loads it from the KDE 6 folder in your home directory. And that works in both bash and fish and maybe ZSH2, but I haven't tried that. So now we can get started on our apps. And the first step, as uh, Nico and I told you last year at Academy, is to disable deprecated API. 
but you should really make sure that you are using uh, latest frameworks because lots of API that was uh, removed in KF6 um, had backported deprecation macros and maybe even the alternative API or some porting aid um, to the KF5 branch and those are only contained in the later versions. And then you of course need to adjust your build system. For non-library code it is recommended to just use the version with CMake targets and that is what we do in Plasma. And for other cases like the um, or li like libraries or frameworks we need to use the Qt major version um, but in KF6 master if you want to call it um, we are Qt6 only so at least there we don't have to do it. Um, but yeah you can just uh, inject the major version using this um, known CMake uh, syntax for injecting the strings and you can use it for both the find, packet, uh, find module calls and when using KF5 targets because we intentionally decided not to have versionless KDE frameworks targets. Um, but you should make sure the uh, Qt version option is included and that is a module from extra CMake modules or ECM and it is, it is usually included by the KDE installers already um, but in case you're getting like weird error messages keep that in mind and here you can see a really simple snippet uh, on where to use that uh, major version then but since doing all of this manual work is tedious uh, Laurent has shared his uh, script for adjusting most of the build system stuff and you can check it out in the KDE dev scripts repository and there's a KF6 folder which contains um, this build system script and there are also some other scripts for like porting um, Kirigami APIs and such. But not all changes can be caught by deprecation macros for example changes to virtual methods because they are binary incompatible or classes being renamed or moved. And um, that is also what was done for the KCMs because we had um, the KC module class in KConfig widgets and also in KDeclarative some other KCM related classes and all of them were moved to KCM utils and had um, or had gotten a new name and those need to be adjusted with a preprocessor macro and in some code you can still or you can see that there is a Qt version check used but if we only want to differentiate between the 5 and 6 version we can uh, use the major version directly and don't need to um, utilize the Qt version check. But QML runtime issues are more difficult to port especially when they are incompatible with uh, KF5 and it is possible to configure those files using CMake and there it has a configure file method that allows you to like dynamically inject um, certain strings and you can then install the generated QML files or include them in your QRC and that is what's done for example in ELISA but depending on the complexity it is a big hassle like if only a few properties got renamed it is of course doable or an import has changed but for uh, more complex refactorings it is possible and even desirable to have a separate KF6 branch and that leads to a cleaner Qt ba code base because you need less compatibility code and you can utilize new features and APIs if you wish but there's also the risk of diversions and you have a bit more maintenance effort and so it also depends on how actively developed your app is if there are still many features being developed or not. And when actually doing the porting since we now know how to proceed and the plugin system is one of the major challenges and in KF6 both the runtime and build time JSON conversion was removed that includes the K plugin metadata from desktop fi uh, file method and also the K coordinates desktop to JSON CMake function but the desktop to JSON CLI tool which you should use for the manual conversion is still kept and um, if you're wondering why this doesn't have a major version it was removed in uh, KF6 so we don't have to worry about co-installability and you can use it just from the uh, 5k core add-ons. And when you encounter deprecation warnings regarding the plugin system and the documentation of the API provider or the warnings you get on the console are quite important because they tell you what plugin namespace should be used and the version that the change is compatible with. 
And after the conversion, you just need to adjust your macros. You can see two of them. Those are the ones we usually use. Also, the way of determining the plugin ID has changed because previously the ID was often specified in the metadata, and in KF6, we only use the base name for it. And you also get a warning on the console in case the ID you've specified, which is now internally ignored, um, but if that, that ID is different from the base name, and you can just remove it in that case because that is compatible with KF5. And the porting of K service type trader is documented and was already discussed last year. And since then, there were only a few uh, breaking changes for like in system providers, like the keyword parameter of the K plugin factory create method was removed, but um, that will only affect you in case you have a custom macro for it or you have a custom factory. But there are some improvements you can utilize. For example, the find plugin by ID method has better performance because it can now directly load the plugin from disk and doesn't need to query all the available plugins. And that also allows better compatibility in case you want to utilize static plugins. And there's now a parameter for allowing plugins with empty metadata. And what is mostly relevant for developers is the operator. So you can uh, lock a K plugin metadata object directly. And here you can see an, oops, an example on how that would look, like the plugin ID and the file name. And you can, of course, benefit from the optimized internals of K plugin factory and K plugin metadata. And we would also be very happy to have you at the buffs. And yeah, feel free to ask any questions. <laughs> Are there any questions? Wait, I mean, for the, the Ocular case, I don't think we have a, a nice solution at this point, right? So the somewhat, or, well, at least part of the idea how we try to minimize that problem is to get as much as possible done for the first release or in a relatively short period of time, right? The, because that, that doesn't solve the problem in a theoretical way, but practically the problem is much less likely to occur, right? And maybe we get away with some of those corner cases then. Um, but yeah, in, in theory, you would need to co-install co Ocular in both versions, right? And that, I'm not sure if we really want to go there. Um, well, not necessarily the full Ocular, just Ocular part and everything that this uses like some internal oculips, but not necessarily two ocular executables. Sure, but I mean, this is like 80 or 90% of the code, right? It's duplicate packaging, it's maintaining the five thing for some more time, right? Ideally, we wouldn't want to do any of that, right? But in, an, in an ideal world, but. Right. I mean, in an ideal world, we just get ported, get everything ported, right, and ignore that problem, right? So and that is, I hope we can do much of that. It's probably to some degree also a case-by-case case thing. Ocular is fairly widely used as a part, but it's, I think it's manageable to port most or all of the consumers. Then there's stuff like Q Extras, which we will probably have to ship both flavors off for the foreseeable future because Q is used everywhere, and without Q Extras, Q is not that useful. Yeah. That would break the file dialogues, right? And I mean, as long as we have major Qt5 uh, consumers out there, like say Twitter, right, we can't break their file dialog. So. Okay, so um, maybe I'm asking a stupid question or I've misunderstood something, but um, can't you just drop the .qrc files uh, since uh, the new Qt6 CMake API uh, will base if you make a QML module and uh, list the file, the resource files under resources. Uh, that's for the uh, yeah. the QML porting, right? Uh, yeah. Again, maybe. Um, yeah, the thing is that we don't use that at the moment, and we have our own like version of that. In ECM, it's just called ECM add QML module. 
Um, but in case one um, needs to like inject such um, compatibility strings using CMake, one still has to make sure that like the um, version of the file from the build directory which is configured is picked up. Um, maybe one can just specify an absolute path in the Qt APIs on the Qt CMake function for that, or how is it practically used? <laughs> okay. Yeah, better to wait until Monday, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I have a question regarding the plug-in uh, thing. I'm sure you have already thought about that, but, um, well, if you decide to drop the uh, KDE 5 plugin, for example, for Ocular, and replace it with a plugin that for uh, KDE 5 that internally uses the KDE 6 plugin, would something like that work? Um. The, the main problem there is we can't really have both major Qt versions in the same process. Um, if that would be possible, right, then a whole lot of those problems would go away. But since that doesn't work, right, we, we can't put this in the same process, right? And then no matter how we try to bridge or proxy this, that will always end up with both Qt versions in the same process. And then you have competing event loops and flashing symbols, and okay. it will crash. You can proxy it using Wayland, but it's out of process. <laughs> right, you would need to put it out of process, but then we're getting in a whole new, different world of pain. Um, let's just port everything and be done with it. That is that's a much easier approach. Well, actually, we can have two Qt libraries in the same. We, we, we made that possible for Qt 5 and Qt 4, but requires that the, peop, that the application that uh, opens the, the plugin uses uh, a feature called like deep link so that the, the plugin does its own linking and finds its own libraries instead of reusing those of the host library. Of course, you can still don't do anything with, with dual event loops, interface that doesn't use any Qt data structures, then you can do it because we had these problems that there was certain types of libraries that had like a plugin or used to uh, Qt. So in that, so we solved that back in Qt five days early. But, but that is on like the, the symbol level, right? Yeah, yeah. That's Versus only if you have an a API yeah. that needs Qt interfaces. Right. <laughs> so right, it's so not that useful for KDE. Right. Yeah. But, like Qt plugin loader would even ref user usually yeah. refuse to load any plugin that was built against a different version, even if if it's the yeah. same major version. Uh, yeah, and I mean, sure. With, also with stuff like namespacing and so on, you, you could work around the symbol problem, uh, true. But I mean, the Ocular part is like an interactive yeah. thing, right? So this needs rendering and. Uh, mm -hmm. and user interaction and please let's not go there. <laughs> so I didn't see any date in there. <laughs> okay. Um, well, <laughs> technically there is no date yet, right? So the um, current preliminary thinking on all of this, right, um, subject to change. Um, I think the, the, we, we basically have to go backwards from the Plasma plan for, for Plasma 6. Um, the uh, current state is still thinking towards end of the year. So assuming we manage that for Plasma, right, then we would need frameworks in, say, November, which means starting with pre-releases in August or September, right? So this is this is getting really close then. Uh, and then maybe uh, gear 23, 12 um, would then fall in the same cycle, right, and could contain the first six phase cycle. So I think that that is the, the, the best case scenario, right? We, we certainly won't be faster than that. Um, so far, I think we are still still on track to, to make that. So, um, if we don't make that, right, then, then it slips by four months or whatever is then the, the next window where we, where we uh, but the plan is basically to to follow the the plasma plan and then work backwards from there okay thank you